Now that we have a theory for consumer behavior, it is time to turn our attention to the productive side of the economy. In our equilibrium business cycle model, we will have a representative firm that will choose how much capital and labor to use in order to maximize profits, subject to technology constraints. Profits are given by the difference between revenues and costs. Total revenues are equal to price times quantity produced. Let's assume price is to be equal to 1 without loss of generality. Then, total revenue is given by the quantity produced by employing K capital and L labor units, or in other words, by the production function. Total costs are just the sum of capital and labor units weighted by their respective real prices. The difference between the two gives us the objective function of the firm, which is maximized by choosing to employ capital and labor according to the following first-order conditions. In equilibrium, a unit increase in labor or capital is paid the value added it brings to the production, that is, the marginal product. Since we assume perfect competition and constant returns to scale technology, factor payments exhausts output. These are essentially capital and labor demand equations, since they provide a relationship between prices and quantity of factors to be employed. This production structure is exactly the same we looked on when building the solo model, so nothing new here. Looking closer at factor demand equations, let's plot labor demand. For a given technology level A and capital input K, the marginal product of labor decreases as the labor input L increases. Therefore, the marginal product of labor, given by the downward sloping curve, declines on the vertical axis as L rises on the horizontal axis. The decreasing real wage in labor comes from the fact that holding capital fixed, labor has diminishing returns, and on the margin, the firm is willing to pay less and less for an additional hour of work, or an additional worker. Let's assume for now that labor supply is inelastic, and workers supply LS units of labor irrespectively of the wage. We will relax this assumption later. How is equilibrium formed? Well, at W over P1, the wage is so high that the market does not clear, as firms' demand for labor is smaller than labor supply. This cannot be an optimal outcome, as there would be workers available to work for smaller real wages. At W over P2, the wage is too small, as firms would want to hire a lot more people than they can find. Other firms would be willing to pay higher wages for the same workers, and this firm would have problems in finding workers in the first place. In wage over P star, we have that supply equals demand, and every, for every firm wanting to hire a worker at that wage finds a worker, and every worker wanting to work for that wage finds a job. We say that the labor market clears. Neither workers or firms have an incentive to deviate, and we say that the labor market is in equilibrium. The demand for capital and the capital rental market work in the similar way. The demand for capital will be decreasing in the rental price of capital, again because of diminishing returns. And assuming, as before also, an inelastic capital supply, the equilibrium in the rental market for capital services is achieved when supply meets demand at R over P star. We now have all the ingredients to look at our equilibrium business cycle model. The following framework of analysis gained popularity due to the contributions of Edward Prescott and Finn Shidlan, two laureates with the Nobel Prize for their contributions in two areas of dynamic macroeconomics, the time consistency of economic policy and the driving forces behind business cycle fluctuations. In previous lectures, we look at some recessions with a high level of detail, namely the Great Recession of 2008 and the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020. Before that, other episodes of deep economic distress can be recalled, like the Great Depression of 1929 or the dot-com burst of 2001. There are fundamental differences between explanations for each of the aforementioned crises, and some economists even argue, as Bob Lucas, that economists, for example, will never develop models that will forecast sudden falls in the value of financial assets, like the declines that followed the failure of Lehman Brothers in September of 2008. However, this should not deter us in trying to understand how, once the economy is hit with some shock, be it financial, health or other, how do we expect variables such as employment, wages 
and interest rates to move with GDP. Narratives of past recessions are important to illustrate mechanisms through which such disruptions emerge, but it's very hard to use them in a way that could lead us to anticipate the next recession. As such, the focus of our analysis will be rather on assuming that such disturbances express themselves as shocks to total factor productivity. That when a negative shock hits, total productivity drops, and it is our job to understand the implications of such drop through all the markets we introduced before – goods, capital, labor, bonds, and money. This will produce model predictions for how the different markets behave that can then be compared with the data and help us understand the cyclical behavior of the economy. Consequently, TFP is to be thought of as a residual, as a representation of many possible shocks and explanations as to why the same quantity of capital and labor may lead to different levels of output in different moments in time. Let's now take a quick look at that mathematical formulation of the equilibrium business cycle model, many times known also as the real business cycle model, because money doesn't play a role in the analysis, for reasons we will study further ahead. In a nutshell, this sums up to the solo model, but now with an endogenous savings determined by permanent income behavior, and the possibility to choose how many hours of work to supply. Remember, the analytical framework we developed to study permanent income hypothesis and the life cycle model. We had a representative household that shows how much to consume and save in each period for the duration of his lifetime. He did so in order to maximize lifetime utility. Here, we are going to assume that households can choose also how much to work in every period and that they live forever, just for simplicity. They choose now how much to work because every hour at work has a utility cost, since it is one less hour of leisure and households in this setup value leisure time. Households are constrained as before. Their consumption plus what they save, which is equal to investment XT, must be financed by wage and capital income once taking into account net transfers from the government. The productive sector of the economy is as we described before, but now Total factor productivity is a random variable to reflect the fact that the economy is subject to partially unexpected shocks. We assume that this stochastic process is random but involves some degree of persistence. That is, if TFP is above its unconditional mean today, it is more likely than not that it will also be above its unconditional mean tomorrow, although less so. To close the model, we need two more conditions. First, an aggregate resource constraint that states that private and public consumption plus investment must equal all the goods produced in the economy, and the capital accumulation law that we studied before. To solve the model, we set up the household problem to maximize lifetime utility subject to the budget constraint and taking prices as given, and take first order conditions. We also take into account the firm's first order conditions that state that the wage and rental price of capital are equal to marginal products of labor and capital respectively. This leads to the four equations that fully characterize optimal behavior of households in this environment. One, the resource constraint. Two, the production function. Three, the labor leisure choice. And four, the savings optimality condition, also known as the Euler equation. We are using the notation where the subscript in a function represents the derivative of that function with respect to the subscript variable. So UL represents the derivative of the utility function with respect to labor, and FK represents the derivative of the production function with respect to capital, for example. The only new elements here are the labor leisure choice and Euler equations. Let's look at each at a time. The labor leisure equation states that the marginal rate of substitution between labor and consumption, that is, how much leisure should decrease in order to compensate for a unit increase in consumption, is equal to the wage in equilibrium. This means that the wage is the relative price of consumption versus leisure. 
since utility is a function of both leisure and consumption, and the production structure implies that more leisure means that agents will have less work hours and consequently smaller earnings to finance consumption, there is a trade-off between the two. The wage rate is precisely what pins down the relative amount of leisure versus consumption in equilibrium. This is essentially a labor supply condition. Hold consumption fixed and you have a relationship between prices, the wage rate, and quantities, the number of hours agents would want to work for that wage. To get the equilibrium in the labor market, we equate supply and demand and get that the marginal rate of substitution between leisure and consumption is equal to the marginal product of labor. Pause for a moment to think about the income and substitution effects we discussed previously. If the wage rate goes up, it means the opportunity cost of not working just increased. In other words, leisure just got more expensive relative to consumption. Why? Because now one hour working or one hour less of leisure buys more consumption than it did before. So households will react optimally by reducing leisure and increasing work hours worked to afford more consumption. This is precisely the substitution effect we discussed earlier. When the relative price of two things that make you happy changes, households change their behavior by shifting to the one which got cheaper, be it an increase in the interest rate, making consumption tomorrow cheaper, or an increase in the wage, making consumption more attractive relative to leisure. We now look at the savings optimality condition. The equation states that the marginal utility of consumption today must be equal to the expected marginal utility of consumption tomorrow. This is nothing fundamentally new, as we saw a similar condition when studying the life cycle model. There are only two novelties here. The first is the expectation operator. Since total factor productivity is now stochastic, households assign probabilities to the different values that DFP can take tomorrow based on today's information. So, they equate marginal utility of consumption today to expected marginal utility of consumption tomorrow. The second is that we substituted the interest rate that before was exogenous and constant with the marginal product of capital that because of stochastic TFP is now time varying. Just as for the labor versus leisure condition, you can also look at the other equation in terms of supply and demand of savings. Choosing consumption is the complementary act of choosing how much to save, holding hours worked fixed. So you have a relationship between the supply of savings, a quantity, and the rental price of capital, R, in the first equality. We substitute the rental price of capital away by equating this to the demand for capital, where the rental price is equal to the marginal product of capital. The fact that the interest rate and the rental price of capital, including depreciation, are also equated is what we call a no-arbitrage condition. Remember that households can save through bonds or capital. But in this simplified representation of the world, bonds and capital have the same risk, which means that they must offer the same return. If that was not the case, if the rental price of capital net of depreciation exceeded the interest rate on bonds, the demand for capital would go up, driving the rental of price of capital down. On the opposite, if the rental price of capital would be below the interest rate, nobody would want to hold capital, and then firms would have to offer higher rents to be able to operate. The only equilibrium is precisely where the two returns are equalized. We call this the no arbitrage condition. Today, most macroeconomic models used in research or by central banks and other institutions are extended versions of this basic framework. We will pursue some of these extensions later on when studying the nominal side of the economy and the effects of monetary policy. For now, it suffices to say that this was the standard analytical framework through the 80s and some of the 1990s. At the time, because agents were responding optimally to changes in total factor productivity and markets would clear, the implication was markets were efficient in dealing with fluctuations and that there was no need for government intervention beyond what would be necessary to let markets work efficiently. Today, 
Our understanding of this framework is very different, and we see shocks to total factor productivity as a reduced form representation of many possible mechanisms that may, or not, include dynamics as the ones we discussed regarding the Great Recession and the COVID-19 pandemic. However, note that in the real business cycle framework, all fluctuations come from shocks to total factor productivity, and consequently to just one of the four equations that determine the dynamics of the model economy. It is possible, though, that fluctuations in the economy come as a result from deviations in any of the other three equations too. This is the basis for business cycle accounting, a business cycle analysis methodology introduced by Patrick Kehoe, Faradara Janchari, and Ellen McRotten in 2007. They emphasize that deviations from equilibrium conditions in the real business cycle model are but the representation of underlying mechanisms that generate fluctuations in the economy. In growth accounting, you look at changes in output through the lens of the production function. In business cycle accounting, you look at changes in output, investment, and hours work through the lens of the equilibrium business cycle model. You can have mechanisms that generate fluctuations through deviations in the production function, represented by movements in total factor productivity, just like in the standard real business cycle model. In the labor leisure choice, where we included a term called the labor wedge, represented by 1 minus tau well, that, like TFP, is whatever it needs to be to make the equation hold for all TS. In the consumption savings decision, also adding the term 1 plus tau x, that, as before, is going to be whatever it needs to be to make the equation hold with equality for all Ts, and through changes in the aggregate resource constraint assuming that government consumption, GT, is time-varying and allowing for open economy consideration includes also net exports. Just as before, the business cycle accounting model is characterized by four equations, with the terms in red being total factor productivity and three other shocks, and that extend the same reasoning to each of the four equations, compute all deviations from equilibrium conditions as residuals. This way, we can use the model to see, for a given period of economic fluctuations, which equations were more disturbed, and assess the quantitative relevance of each distortion in explaining these events. Now, economic fluctuations can come from any of the four variables, called wedges, or any combination of them. This is particularly useful because knowing which wedge, or combination of wedges, is responsible for a period of fluctuations, we can look in the literature for candidate explanations. It could be that wage rigidity led to a period of slow comeback from a recession. If that is the dominant mechanism in reality, then the labor wedge, 1 minus tau well, should be the one that generates all the action. The same analysis can be made as today we know how different mechanisms, like sudden stops, financing restrictions, and others, show up as wedges to the baseline business cycle accounting model. It so happens that mechanisms that show up as total factor productivity are the ones that are most promising in explaining most economic fluctuations. What you see in this plot is, by country, an analysis of which are the models that make smaller errors when compared with the data. If models that include mechanisms that show up mostly as TFP, depicted in the plot as black squares, that show up in the labor leisure choice with the gray circles, in the Euler equation with the white squares, or in the aggregate resource constraint with the white squares. As we can confirm, for most countries for which the study was performed, in the period of 1970 to 2010, Mechanisms that create fluctuations that show up like total factor productivity shocks are, on average, the dominant source of business cycle fluctuations. As such, we will focus mainly on total factor productivity shocks as sources of business cycle fluctuations from now onwards. <laughs>